it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joao Penedones, who's uh, my colleague. We live at the same floor uh, in the theoretical physics uh, here at EBFL. So you have his uh, bio here. I won't uh, read it through. But Joao is, uh, so he qualifies uh, here as a mathematical physicist. And uh, I would say he is a, a theoretical physicist of high energy physics and field theory. And, uh, but what he's, he really is, is a, is a string theorist. And uh, as you all know from uh, Big Bang Theory, string theory is the most consistent uh, theory of grand unification theory of everything. So after we have seen uh, the, the, the experiments on uh, anti-hydrogen, I think he will explain us the reason of it all today. <laughs> And I'm very curious to listen to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. And thanks to the students for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, I wish to lower your expectations. <laughs> I will not explain everything in the universe today. So after this uh, great talk about this amazing experiment in iter anti-hydrogen, I feel a bit like the, the poor kid in the neighborhood that doesn't have money for real toys and has to play with his imagination, so... There is an advantage, because once you learn how to play with your imagination, then there is no budget constraint, okay? Then you can just free to go. So let's start playing. So a very simple question. What happens when you send one photon against another photon? And I'm not crazy, of course. Your experience is that I, for example, I can look at Vicenzo and I see Vicenzo, I see the photons that come. I don't see the photons, I don't see myself, right? The photons don't scatter of photons, okay? That's our experience. You disagree? Yeah. Photons scatter with photons? Interacting with matter with matter, right? But in vacuum, we've never observed photon scattering of a photon. But again, as I said, we use our imagination, so we can ask this question. Suppose we could do this experiment and prepare photons with some energy E, and we put some detector, let's say at 90 degrees or something, some big detector, and we wait. Most of the times we won't see anything because photons will just cross each other, not scatter. But I claim that at some point we will see something. Okay? So the question is, if you want, what is the probability of seeing some energetic particle? Let's say some particle which at least half of the energy of the incoming photon. Okay? So that's the question that we can uh, discuss for a moment. So, so let me tell you what we know. So the, the answer is we don't know, but we have some guesses. So kind of this picture tells you more or less what we know. So for very low energies, basically the probability is very, very small. I will give you an estimate in the next slide. And this part, we have a lot of confidence. Okay? So we have a lot of confidence that these low energy photons, we understand how do they interact. Then, as you go above, say, the energy that we can make for at the LHC, for the, the energy of the protons of the LHC, then we start to enter some difficult world. And then if you go to photons which have energies of order of the Planck energy, so 10 to the 19 EV, then we really know next to nothing. And then we again have some good guesses for what happens if you make ultra high energy photons, OK? This, uh, it's more qualitative, but I will explain what, what we expect there. And uh, I mean, this is very frustrating because this is not just imagination like uh, coming up with some fantasy world, Game of Thrones or something like that. This is really imagining something that we could in principle do, right? We could just set up some, uh, well, even some laser beam and the only thing we would have to do to make it very high energy is just to put the, the laser producing machine moving at a very high speed relative to the other 
uh, laser producing machine. Okay, if we have two amazing rockets moving at a speed at a speed close to the speed of light, one against the other, we would see these laser beams colliding at arbitrarily high energy. In principle, right? Oh, so it's a question about nature. It could happen. This experiment. What happens? It's if we don't know it, we still don't understand the world. So let me explain you in a bit in more detail the low energy part of this plot. So this part we understand quite well. The leading interaction between the photons goes through this process. Okay? It's an extremely rare process. That's why photons at low energy almost don't interact. But it goes like that. A photon can split into a, an electron and a positron. The other photon does the same. And then the electron annihilates with the positron forms another photon, and you see two photons going in generically any direction. Okay? I plotted here, this photon could go with the same energy as the initial one towards the, the detector. And here I just wrote the generic dependence on the parameters. So, well, this first factor, don't worry too much, is basically the geometry if you have like the width of your laser beam. What matters here is really this factor, okay? It goes like the eighth power of the energy, this probability. So it's extremely, extremely low at low energies, okay? And the energy that matters here is already a very high energy, actually I, I showed it here, which is the energy that you need to produce an electron. It's already 10 to the five electron volts, where I remind you visible photons are of the order of one electron volt, okay? So if you do, quick calculation, you get that like visible photons would scatter with this incredibly tiny probability, okay? So indeed, they don't scatter. Well, in principle, we could make many, many photons and measure a few. The problem is that uh, then how would we be sure that it was from scattering and not from some impurity in the vacuum or some, some other problem? But that's not a problem for me. I can just use my imagination. It's pure vacuum. There's nothing inside the chamber. Okay. So this is, this is the lowest energies. So this we know very well because, well, we know the opposite process, right? We know that, um, no, sorry. Sorry, we know this process because we know that electron and proton can annihilate into photons, and so we know that this is very well described by the standard model. So now let me go to the other extreme, to the ultra high energy photons. So why do we have good expectations about what happens here? So if you really go to the ultra high energy, what do I mean by that? I mean that you make a photon that has so much energy, like the two photons of so much energy, that when they collide, they will form a black hole. And so it's very easy to estimate, so you just have to know that the radius of the black hole they form is just proportional to the energy, okay? Where this is the Planck energy I showed you before, so you have to have a lot of energy, and then the radius will be proportional to this Planck length, which is a tiny length, as you can see here, okay? But once the radius of the black hole that you would form is bigger than the width of your beam, then basically with probability one, these two photons, they just form a black hole, okay? Because they will pass through each other so close that they will be inside the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole with that energy. So once that happens, you, you expect an ex extremely small probability of detecting a high energy particle in your detector. Because once you form a, a big black hole, the black hole just evaporates thermally, okay? It's, it's a big object, and it will emit just photons with energies about the same uh, given by KBT, where T is the temperature of this black hole, okay? So this will be for a high energy, for a large black hole, so if the energy is really large, this will be a low temperature, and basically, the radiation that will come out will just be soft radiation, so the probability is exponentially small. And this is exactly like you do if you want to know like, the probability of like, all the particles of gas in a box going, say, all to the half of the size of the box. Okay? So if you ask this question, it's extremely rare, right? We have some gas, 
it's extremely rare that all the molecules decide to go to the left part of the box, but it can happen. It's just rare because it's one very special configuration in the space of all possible configurations of the gas. Okay? So it's the same here. The black hole has a huge number of internal states. Okay? So that's measured by this entropy, which grows with the energy squared. And the fact that the black hole can decay to like just two very energetic uh, particles is an extremely rare event the same way all the particles inside the box going to the left. Okay. So its estimate is basically the exponential of minus the entropy, which just means it's like one possibility in the big space of configurations of the black hole. Okay, so that tells you that it's very small on the, on the other side, the probability. We also have some good guesses for the um, intermediate energies. So once you go above the energy required to produce electrons and positrons, that's actually the dominant effect. So in your detector, you will start detecting mostly electrons and positrons, and that's this simple diagram here. Uh, okay, again, don't matter too much about the formulas, but you see it's more likely now it's not e to the eighth, it's e to the fourth power, and it's suppressed by the same type of constants, so this is much more likely event. And there is also, even if there is no charged matter, imagine we lived in, other, in a world where there was no electron, there was just photons and gravitons, still there would be some interaction between photons mediated just by gravity, and again, it would grow very slowly with energy. Okay? So the, the qualitatively to be similar. Just here, of course, it's much smaller, the effect, the gravitational effect. Okay, okay so that's it. We have this um, incomplete knowledge. Moreover, there is this contrast that we start at low energies with very, very small probability and the probability starts growing with energy. And then we know that actually if you go to the ultra high energies, we expect it to be small again, okay? So something must happen in the middle and we just don't know how to calculate. But as um, Vicenzo introduced me, I'm supposed to be a string theorist, so I should know how to calculate these processes in, in quantum gravity. So let me just, uh, I was kind of afraid of that, so I made a slide about string theory. So what does string theory tell you about this? Can you calculate this in string theory? Well, in principle, yes. So let me just write a formula. So let's say the probability is just a function of this energy that of the photon over the Planck energy. Okay? That's the basic probability. It's pre-factor, don't worry, it's just geometry of the beam. We don't need to worry about that now. Okay? So this I'm here I'm doing simplifying the world, since this question is already hard in a world without electrons. Let's just think of the world without with photons and gravitons. That would be complicated enough to, to understand. So in that case, it would be just that, just a single function of this ratio. And I can do a Taylor expansion of this function, okay? So I just expand this, like you learn in calculus, in Taylor expansion. And what string theory is good for is to calculate the Taylor coefficients, okay? So string theory can calculate this A1, this A2, this A3, but each one of these coefficients is harder and harder to calculate. And basically the state of the art is basically maybe this A3. I think for a process of this type, it would be A3, okay? So in practice, this doesn't tell you much about the full function if you want to know when the, the variable is very large, right? A Taylor expansion is good around the value we're expanding, right? Here around zero, energy zero. So, okay, to be honest, there are other ways to approach this question in string theory but they are basically equally non-calculable in principle, okay? So, or in practice, sorry. So in practice, string theory has this uh, problem that we just, the calculations are too hard. And even if we had the full series, we still had a problem of how to actually resum it. But okay, that's a bit more of a technical, I think. So, so what to do? We cannot do the experiment because, well I, well, I can ask the experimentalists, but I, making photons of this ultra high energy seems to be really much harder than making anti-hydrogen, so it's not gonna work. Theory 
the best theory we know is not calculable in practice, so what to do? So, this is my suggestion. Perhaps a better strategy, actually this morning I was thinking about that. One possible strategy was to say, okay, this problem is too hard, let's just go and work in artificial intelligence, because that's very popular nowadays, and maybe in 30 years we'll have a machine that can help us solve this problem. But, uh, but okay, I'm a bit more impatient, and 30 years I'll be too old anyhow, so I prefer to think of the problem right now. And so, our idea is to approach this problem, well, our idea, it's an old idea, but we are thinking about it again, is to approach this problem just uh, from very general principles. So, instead of trying to really calculate what you get in a precise theory or what you get in nature, which you cannot do the experiment, we will just ask what are the possible outcomes given that um, we have to respect several very general principles that we already know about the physical theories. In particular, we know that all these principles apply to string theory. Okay? So we know that whatever answer string theory will give, and, and even more general than that, we expect that any consistent theory of quantum gravity will satisfy these principles. So what we'll try to do is not to find the exact answer, but just to try to find a bound on the space of possibilities, okay? You see, like, what is the maximum scattering, the minimum scattering, and how it can move from one to the other at a given energy. Okay, so this is the dream, and now what I'm going to do is to explain you a bit about each one of these basic principles, and I'll give you some simple illustration of how this actually can work, to tell you something about scattering amplitudes, okay? But I won't solve the problem that I put today, okay? That's a problem that is still open. We are actually want to work on, on that problem more directly, but it's a problem for the future and to motivate you to think about theoretical physics, okay? And I'm worried with time. Can you tell me how? I'm, I'm halfway. Okay. Good, so now let's, uh, let's discuss each one of these principles um, one by one. So the first one, ah, sorry, before discussing these principles, I need to define you a bit more precisely the kind of variables that we should use to describe scattering. So probably most of you already know this, but let me just remind you. Let's think of this scattering experiment, just for the sake of simplicity, as a classical scattering. Okay, just of particles against some target. So I create some uniform beam of particles, so there's a uniform probability of particles being distributed along this transverse area A, okay? And now I just train the particles against this target and they will scatter off the target with some scattering angle theta. And so the total cross-section is basically just this probability that I was defining, so probability of scattering at any angle, different from zero, of course, some non-trivial scattering, multiplied by the area of the transverse beam. Okay, that's this one here. If you want a more cleaner definition would be that, to like the number of particles that scatter per unit time divided by the flux of particles in your incoming beam. Okay, the number of particles per unit time, per unit area. And, I mean, it's called total cross-section because if really these particles just scatter off the target as billiard balls, then uh, this total cross-section will be just a geometric cross-section of the target, okay? Really this area of the target when as seen by the particles. So this is just to remind you. And so now, most of the time I'll just discuss cross-section in terms of, instead of this probability. And so let me now discuss this problem of Lorentz invariance. So Lorentz invariance is just a statement that the same experiment seen by an observer at rest or an observer moving must give the same results. In particular, the number of particles that scatter must be independent of the state of motion of the observer. Okay? So here, I'll give you an example. So if you send two particles, one against the other, 
uh, with the same uh, velocity, let's say identical particles, so the center of mass, you are, I mean, and we are at rest looking at this process, then we are at the center of mass of the collision, so that's one possibility of analyzing the collision, but you can also now be another observer that is moving at the same velocity as particle two, so particle two will look at rest, and particle one will just be moving faster, okay? And so if you measure this scattering experiment in these two uh, reference frames, you must get the same result. In particular, the number of particles that scatter, the total cross-section must be the same. And here I show you how that works in, in math, if you want. So what happens is plotted here. So I plot here energy and momenta along the beam, okay? along the scattering axis. And you see, in the center of mass, I have one and two. So I have momentum positive and negative exactly with opposite values. And then when I go to the rest frame of particle two, so particle two is stopped as zero momenta, only as energy, and particle one as faster, as more momenta. And the rule in special relativity is very simple. It's just that the length along this curve here, which is the curve that sets the energy as a function of the momenta, okay, this hyperbola, the length is the same. So the black length here between one and two is the same as the length between two prime and one prime. So moving from in reference frame just is just moving the two vectors along this hyperbola, keeping the length fixed, okay? So that's if you want the invariant on which the cross-section depends. So that, that's the first thing. It should only depend on this invariant. Very general principle, results should not depend on the observer, okay? So that's one thing we know. What else do we know? Okay, so now to explain you this part, I need to also think about waves. So you can also do scattering experiments with waves. So here, I just put waves in water, some frequency omega, and they are going against an island, so they will scatter off the island and there's like waves going in all directions. Of course, the waves, as they go away from the island, they will decay like one over R, and the amplitude will depend in which angle it goes. I mean, it depends on the shape of the island, okay? It's a calculation we can try to do, but that's not important. The important part is that the amplitude of the waves as they go out is proportional to the amplitude of the waves as they go in, right? If I put bigger waves, I'll get bigger waves. And it's natural then to define this ratio of the out amplitude by the in amplitude as the scattering amplitude, because that's independent of the amplitude of the wave I send in, and it's an intrinsic property of the shape of this island, okay? That's, if you know the shape of the island, you can measure the scattering amplitude and vice versa. Okay, and uh, this is also related to the total cross-section, so you can also define for waves something like the total cross-section, which now, instead of counting number of particles, you just count energy, okay? So you count the total power that is scattered in, a give, in all directions, except like t equals zero, and you divide again by the incoming energy flux, okay? So again, you'll get something like, uh, that measures an area, the transverse area, and in wave scattering, this will be proportional to the square of the scattering amplitude because the energy carried by a wave is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the wave. Okay? So that's something I just need to remind you. So I did this classical calculation in waves, but of course, if you remember in quantum mechanics, it's exactly the same thing. Probability is proportional to the square of the wave function, so we will have the same relation for quantum mechanics for the number of particles to measure the probability in terms of the square of the wave function. Okay? So I also have to keep in mind that the scattering experiments have a wave nature behind it. Okay, and now I can explain the other very important uh, property that we know is that it's causality. So if you send some wave at some time, you can only get a scattered wave after. You cannot get it before, okay? That is causality in our world. So if I plot here the wave, so this is the incoming wave in black. It was zero for negative times, 
then the outgoing wave must also be zero for negative times. Right? You cannot get the wave out before you send it in. Okay? So that's, that's causality. And now I have here causality equals analyticity. So this is the most uh, technical slide I have. So if you know complex analysis, you will enjoy. If you don't know complex analysis, you should learn it, okay? So take it as a motivation to go and learn complex analysis because the argument is extremely simple once you know it. If you don't know it, just don't worry about my arguments. It's just this second part of the slide. It's just so beautiful that I could not resist, so let me put it here. Okay. We are here in time. Causality is obvious in time. So we do Fourier transform and we go to frequency. Okay, so time goes to frequency. This is Fourier transform. Okay, physicist, every physicist knows Fourier transforms. And now, what is this statement that the amplitude in real time is zero for negative time? In Fourier space, it's just a statement that the Fourier transform is analytic in the upper half complex plane in frequency space. Okay, so if you know complex analysis, this is relatively obvious because if the function is analytic on the upper half plane, you can just do this integral for negative times by deforming the contour up into the alpha half plane and you get zero. If you don't know complex analysis, this was complete magic what I said, so I apologize for that. But you should go and learn because it's really a beautiful subject. So, the conclusion is that causality tells us that both of these functions, the incoming and the outgoing, are analytic in the upper half plane, and so the ratio is also analytic, okay? So this is a very important property, causality, in theoretical physics is encoded into this very mathematical property, which is not intuitive at all, which is analyticity in the complex energy space, okay? So this is, okay, this is what it is. Okay, and now I just list here two other, two other essential uh, general properties. So one of them we call crossing symmetry. And I have here these this drawings. So this property is, well, you can think of it as, as particle physicists usually say, like an antiparticle is like a particle moving backwards in time. So that's, that's a bit of a mysterious sentence, but in practice what it means is that if you know the scattering amplitude for a process like that, A plus B go to C plus D, so A, B, and C, D are like types of particles, then you can just invert and you transform, say the particle C becomes, instead of being a final state, becomes an in state, so I just change the momenta from P3 to minus P3, so it becomes an incoming particle. And I have to transform it also to an antiparticle, so A plus C bar. And I can do the same, for example, with particle B. It was an incoming particle, and I flip it to an outgoing particle. Okay. So the scattering amplitude of A plus B is the same, sorry, A, B goes to C, D is the same as A, C bar goes to B bar, D bar. The bar means antiparticle. Okay. So this is a, also a general property of quantum field theory and also of string theory, it's, it's, it goes through. And, um, and this is also very constraining, especially if you have particles which are their own antiparticle, then it means that you can trade final state with initial state and get some non-trivial constraint on your scattering amplitude. And the final general observation is that probability must be conserved. So if you sum all the possible final states, all the final possibilities, you must get one, right? The total probability must be one. And uh, that also gives you a constraint on the sum. So as I said before, probabilities are just the square of these scattering amplitudes in quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so this was, if you want, a quick illustration of these general principles that we already know about the scattering amplitudes. And now, the next slide, I will just give you like the simplest possible illustration of uh, what we can do following these general principles. So let me take the simplest possible example, okay? Simplest possible example is I just have one dimension, okay? So particles can only scatter, either they scatter backscatter or they just go through, okay? There's no angle, 
imagine that you have like some thin wire and you're studying excitations on this wire. That's actually something we, we can do. We, we analyze even in experimentally. And so, so in particular here, it doesn't really matter these equations, but uh, the statement is that in, if you want to conserve energy and momenta, which of course you have to conserve, that's also a basic principle, then uh, these two particles, they can either just go through exactly with the same momenta or just backscatter, just changing the momenta. Okay? So it's exactly like in billiard balls, if you have a frontal collision, they will just uh, permute their momenta. Okay? There's nothing, nothing else to do. So the only invariant thing that there is, is really between the initial particle and the final particle, is this length that I described you before, which is called the rapidity between the two particles, okay? So of course you can change that by moving reference frame, going to the center of mass or going to the rest frame of one of the particles, but the scattering amplitude can only depend on this parameter. And now, so what you want to do, what you know, is that the scattering amplitude is a single function, a function of a single variable. Yes, I'll finish in one minute. And, um, and what do we know about this variable? Well, I will just list for you here the properties. So if you go back, I mean, this is a bit technical, so I'm just writing these equations so that you have something concrete to look at. But what I'm saying is that if you go back and go through the list of properties that I explained before, you get that like crossing symmetry gives you a specific reflection of this function. Unitarity gives you that the square for real rapidity must be less or equal to one because that's the probability of going to two particles, to two final particles. And then you also get some analytic behavior because of causality, okay? So it tells you that this scattering amplitude as a function obeys many, many properties Okay, this, basically this list of properties. And now you can ask questions. If I assume all these properties, how can I change the scattering amplitude? What is the most that it can scatter at a given energy or at an other energy, okay? And that allows you to get non-trivial bounds in the space of scattering amplitudes, okay? So I don't have here results for the photon because the photon is a bit more complicated, has some elicity states, we are working on it. So maybe in one or two years, if you invite me again, I will explain you the photon case. So, so I will just conclude like this here and uh, just uh, summarize in the following way. So my message for you is there are many important open problems in fundamental physics. It's not just a question of uh, being able to do the experiment or not. There's really things that we don't know the outcome, even in principle. So fundamental physics is still very much an open subject. And in many cases, we cannot do the real experiments, but we can still make a lot of progress just by imagining them, okay? As long as you use the power of math and uh, logical consistency. Okay, thank you very much.